Dayton Rogers, born in 1953, has a criminal background dating back to the age of 16 when he was caught with a friend shooting at passing cars, trying to break windshields. His evil fantasies predated that brush with the law, but he, apparently, stayed out of trouble until the age of 19 when he attacked and stabbed a 15-year-old girl on their second date. Dayton had been married for less than a month at the time. Pleading guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree assault, he was placed on four years probation. At 20, he attacked two teenage girls with a beer bottle. Prosecutors petitioned the court to revoke probation but the judge found him not guilty by reason of insanity, and he was committed to the Oregon State Hospital in March, 1974. He was formally released in December of the same year. As Oregon lawman draws a bead on this violent wacko, they found out that he preferred prostitutes as his prey, had an appetite for kinky sex, and liked to start things rolling with vodka and orange juice. During their investigation, they also learned that he was Oregon's worst serial killer to date, a murderer whose bloodlust knew no bounds, July 7, 1987. A Tuesday was another hot, sultry summer day in Oregon, Heather. Brown 31, a prostitute, had worked the night before in her area along Portland's Union Avenue, a high-crime area dominated by prostitutes, pimps, and drug dealers. Several other hookers had been in place that night, but despite the others, Heather, dressed in a skin-tight outfit that left nothing to the imagination. I never had to wait long for a customer to come along. It had been a busy night for her, and as a result, she had slept until nearly noon. When she climbed out of bed, she reached for her pack of cigarettes but found that it was empty. Needing a smoke, she left her two small children with a roommate and began walking towards a nearby 7-Eleven store again, dressed in the skin-tight outfit that she had worn the night before. About halfway to the store, a man in a blue Nissan pickup stopped and offered her a ride, figuring that she could make a few quick bucks. Heather accepted and climbed inside. The driver headed out of the city toward a wooded area known as the Malala Forest. John introduced himself as Steve and explained that he was a professional gambler from Nevada. They drove along for some time and stopped at a convenience store so that Heather could buy a pack of cigarettes and coke so that Steve could purchase a six-pack of beer. Afterward, they continued driving until they reached the wooded area. When their conversation turned to business, he said that he would drive into the hills, and then he wanted to tie someone up in them. He moved to touch her thigh, but she pushed his hand away and demanded that he take her back to Portland. However, he refused and turned off onto an unpaved logging road where he sped up to about 40 miles per hour. Heather grabbed her shoes off the floor, ready to make a break for it when the time was right. But John caught her eyeing the door handle, and he reacted instantly. He swerved the pickup recklessly so she would lose her sense of balance and reach towards her, placing his hand over her chest to prevent her from jumping out of the truck. He then stepped on the accelerator and was soon speeding to more than 60 miles per hour. Nearly out of her mind with fear, Heather struggled violently and managed to break free of the man's hold. In one swift move, she opened the door and jumped from the speeding truck. The John slowed his vehicle a little bit, but aware that a log truck was close behind, kept on going. When the longer rounded the curve, he saw Heather lying in the road and slammed on his brakes. Seeing that she was injured and grateful that he hadn't hit her, he helped her into the cab of his rig. One of her eyes was bleeding, which he helped her cover, and she had other scrapes and cuts. She told the longer that she had to jump out of the man's pickup because she feared that he planned to kill her since she was obviously very shaken up. The longer didn't probe her with any questions. Instead, he arranged to have her driven to a medical clinic in Malala. She was determined to have suffered a concussion and multiple abrasions to her temple area, right forearm, and hand. The matter was reported to the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department and was written up as case number 87-0998. The incident report would become the first clue of the horror that was already well underway to veteran detective John Turner 44, a distinguished-looking man of Anglo-Saxon descent. Turner had no way of knowing it yet. 
But the evil outrage that was taking its toll on Portland streetwalkers would virtually consume his life for much of the next two years and would eventually lead him to the most vicious and remorseless killer with whom he had ever dealt or would likely ever face again. It's been said that bloodlust is an aberration unique to the human animal. It does so without purpose and has no reverence for the normal needs intrinsic to humankind's survival when it occurs. The aberration for that's really what it is clearly, sexual violence and all evil. It rears its diabolic head when its host fails to achieve sexual gratification in any other way. As a result, many, particularly women and children who unwittingly come into contact with such an individual, die needlessly and without mercy at his hands. Dayton Leroy Rogers, 33 years old when his bloodlust neared its peak, was fearsomely known to many Portland, Oregon's prostitutes as Steve the Gambler and has been afflicted by bloodlust census, late teens. Perhaps longer, it usually materialist in the form of a headache inflicting on him a splitting blinding white pain, and perhaps he was always subconsciously aware that only the sight of another's pain, the sounds of her anguish, or, ultimately the spilling of her blood would relieve his own suffering. When the headaches began, the only way to make them go away was to let his dark side fully emerge. Dayton seemed personable enough on the surface, as long as he wasn't in the midst of one of his mood swings. He was well known in the small communities of Woodburn and Can Be, and people seemed to like him, a mechanic by trade, a skill he had learned in prison. Dayton ran a small successful engine repair business, was married, and had an 18-month-old boy who was a mirror image of him. Few people saw the evil that lay beneath the thin veneer, and many of those who were unlucky enough to witness his dark side firsthand did not live to talk about it. Dayton's headaches seemed to worsen during the summer of 1987, and for that reason, he was away from home much of the time. He claimed that he was working at his shop during his absences, ranging from a few hours to all night. And his wife, Sherry, saw little reason at first to doubt him when she would call to check up on him in the early evening. He usually answered the telephone on the occasions that he didn't. He always had an excuse. He would explain that he had been in the middle of a project and hadn't wanted to leave it to pick up the phone. Or, more commonly, he would tell Sherry that he had gone out to get coffee, perhaps a bite to eat anything that would convince her he was only taking a break to get away from the shop for a while often. However, he waited until it was very late until he was certain that Sherry was in bed and fasted asleep before beginning. The Prowl. Soon his working late became routine, a way of life, and Sherry's phone calls became less frequent. Although she began to hear stories about him frequenting the local taverns and bars, she tried very hard to maintain the faith she always had in him. She might have become suspicious of his activities sooner if only she had taken the trouble to check the mileage on his pickup. Still, she hadn't, and he put more miles on the truck in a single week than most people drive in a month August 6 a Thursday started for the Rogers family. Like most other days. Dayton got up early, showered and shaved, had a light breakfast, and drove to a small engine repair shop in Woodburn before 8 am. Outwardly. He seemed happy the business had picked up during the summer, to the point where he had to hire a man to help him, and several new repair orders were coming in every day. Soon, however, he began to feel the backlog pressures despite the new help, and his headaches became more frequent, as did his nocturnal outings. At times Sherry found herself wondering what had come over him, seeing him sitting quietly and staring into space. But she never said anything, even though she had heard rumors about him, carousing the night spots, and secretly feared that he might be seeing other women. She somehow convinced herself that the pressures from his business had become too great, and she didn't want to do or say anything that might add to his troubles. It wasn't until later that afternoon that the pounding inside Dayton's head became more than he could bear. He had to do something to stop the headache. He left his assistant in charge of the shop and drove to the liquor store at the North Park Plaza in Woodburn, where he purchased a 10-pack of Smirnoff vodka miniatures to replace the depleted stock he normally kept behind the seat of his pickup. He also purchased a couple of bottles of orange juice, the type and the disposable plastic bottles that he liked so well. He drank one of his crudely mixed screwdrivers quickly, and the headache subsided. A little afterward, he returned to his shop and waited, 
thinking and planning the rest of the evening. He needed something more effective than the alcohol for his headache. The remedies were there. He knew out in numbers on Portland streets, his for the asking and a $50 bill. It had all been so easy with all the others that there was no stopping him now. At 8.30 p.m., Dayton drove home, where he had dinner with Sherry and his son. He explained that he had to return to the shop and worked very late, perhaps, into the early morning hours to catch up on some overdue work. Sherry, an attractive, curly-haired silver brunette, at 5 feet 4 inches tall, 120 pounds and 30 pence years younger than Dayton, didn't protest. She never did, devoutly religious and somewhat naive. She always trusted her husband and rarely questioned his activities. Half an hour later, Dayton was gone. He stopped off at his shop, had a couple more drinks, and tinkered with some easier repair projects to kill time. Shortly after midnight, he changed into the stepping out clothes that he kept inside his special closet and waited inside the shop a little longer until he was certain that Sherry had gone to bed. By 12.30 am he was heading toward Portland on August 7, 1987, by 1 a.m. The man who called himself Steve. The gambler was back on Union Avenue, known as Portland's Prostitute Row, looking for some kinky action. After a short cruise, he stopped a blonde near Northeast Union Avenue and Wagon Street. He recognized her as a hooker he'd picked up before during Portland's 1987 Rose Festival. She was a somewhat large woman, but from a distance, she appeared attractive. She knew how to dress and held her weight well. He pulled over and invited her inside, recognizing him as a former customer. The woman didn't hesitate. No one except for John knows the precise details of what happened between the couple from 1 to 3 a.m. but at some time before 3 a.m. They pulled into the parking lot of Denny's restaurant on the 16,200 blocks of Southeast McLaughlin Boulevard in Oak Grove, a Clackamas County suburb of Portland, with the taverns and bars have just closed, the business was brisk. There. It was the only restaurant open in the area at that time of the morning. Michael Fielding, 32, who lived in an apartment nearby, had gone to bed a couple of hours earlier and slept soundly when he suddenly heard the muffled screams of a woman in intense pain. Help me scream. The woman, please help me. Right, I'm as Fielding climbed out of bed and headed for the window that overlooked the parking lot. The screams became louder. No longer muffled. He arrived at the window in time to see a man run beneath the street light. Moments earlier, James Del Key 50 had just arrived at Denny's. He was alone as he parked his 1983 Ford van and started walking toward the restaurant. He heard a woman yelling and screaming but couldn't quite make out what she was saying. But he could see the human forms in the parking lot, in the direction from which the screams had come. Although it was dark, he could see two people, a man, and a woman, who appeared to be struggling with each other. After his eyes adjusted to the darkness of the parking lot, Donkey could not believe what he saw. There near the middle of the parking lot lay a completely naked woman. A man was kneeling over her, but Bulky could not immediately determine why Charles Gates. A disabled customer had just arrived and had barely situated himself in his wheelchair when he heard the screams already outside in the parking lot, and he was on his way over to the woman, as was Donkey. When the man kneeling over, the woman saw the donkey and Gates approaching, he jumped to his feet and ran in the opposite direction. Gates reached the woman first. My God! He slit her throat, exclaimed. Gates falling from his wheelchair experienced and first aid and emergency medical treatment. Gates noted that the woman was not breathing and would not respond to questions, finding any car droid pulse and undaunted by all the blood. He immediately began CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation as the crowd gathered. Donkey instructed restaurant personnel to call for medical and police help. Then he returned to the parking lot, only to discover that Gates' gallant attempts had not revived the woman. Donkey could see why the woman was covered with blood and stab wounds. A couple of minutes later, the donkey again spotted the man he'd seen only moments before kneeling by the nude victim. The man was coming around the building side adjacent to the restaurant and was headed for a small foreign pickup parked nearby. 
that's him. Someone shouted by that time to other bystanders, Stan Connor and Richard. Bergio had rushed over to see what was happening. After learning of the incident, Connor and Bergio ran for their own vehicles. They attempted to block off the parking lot's exits with their cars, but the man with a pickup drove out over the sidewalk. Bergio, determined not to let the guy get away, sped out of the parking lot in his own car in hot pursuit of the pickup, which was now heading south on the Glock Lynn Boulevard toward Gladstone. Bergio chased the pickup through Oak Grove and into nearby Gladstone at times at speeds over 100 miles per hour. Then Bergio got close enough to the pickup to copy down its license plate number, satisfied that he'd done all that he could. Bergio gave up the chase and returned to the crime scene, where he now found a team of Clackamas County Sheriff's deputies and a rescue team from the Oak Lodge Fire Department. The rescuers valiantly tried to revive the woman but to no avail. A short time later, she was loaded into an ambulance and taken to Emanuel Hospital and Health Center in Portland, where she was pronounced dead on arrival. Meanwhile, several deputies rounded up witnesses and took a statement from each six of those interviewed who said they had heard the woman screams for at least two minutes before her body was found. One of the witnesses, Michael Fielding, told the deputies how the woman's screams had awakened him. It sounded as though her screaming had come from inside a closed vehicle through the glass. At first, said Fielding because muffled her shrieks, she was obviously in intense pain and had cried out that she was when Fielding got to the window, though Ali saw was the man who ran beneath the street light. It was like a spotlight. Said Fielding. If he hadn't run beneath it, I wouldn't have seen anything. He told the deputies that he had gotten a good look at the man and likely recognize him if he saw him again. Deputies found several articles of clothing not far from where the victim's body had lain. The clothing is believed to be hers included. Blue jeans, a hooded blue sweatshirt with white trim, and a single tennis shoe. But the deputies wondered where was the other shoe. Found no identification either in the clothing or on the parking lot. But after additional searching, the deputies found a double-length pair of shoelaces tied together with loops at both ends, prompting some to speculate that the woman had been hogtied at one point. A short time later, Clackamas County Sheriff's detectives, John T. Turner and Mike Machado, arrived at the crime scene after being briefed on the morning's events. Turner took the license plate number Oregon, CYW 194 provided by Richard Bergio and ran through the Oregon State Department of Motor Vehicles computer. Moments later, Turner learned that the pickup's registered owner was 33-year-old Dayton Leroy Rogers, whose address was listed as being in the 10,500 block of South Hines Road in Canby, Oregon, about 20 miles south of the crime scene. Turner and a team of deputies reached Rogers' home at approximately 5 a.m. They saw no sign of the pickup on the property. A relative subsequently told them that Rogers was not at home but could likely be found at his auto repair shop in the 11,600 block of Pacific Court in Woodburn, a few miles south of can be the relative told the smooths that Rogers sometimes worked odd hours at the shop. It was 5.35 a.m. when Detective Turner arrived at Rogers' shop after a cursory glance around outside. He knocked on the shop door until a man with bloodshot eyes answered, smelling of alcohol. The man identified himself as Dayton Rogers. After Turner told Rogers that he and the deputies were there as part of a homicide investigation, Rogers allowed them inside, although Detective Turner noted that Rogers' pupils were dilated. He observed that the man had no difficulty walking and that his speech was not slurred, prompting him to conclude that Rogers had been drinking but was not drunk. When asked, Rogers told the detectives that he'd been at the shop all night and had been drinking bourbon and strawberry mixer. Mind if I take a look around, asked Turner. Go ahead and search the place, said Rogers, search the truck if you want to. Rogers told the detective that his pickup had been in the shop all night. Turner shot him a dubious glance, walked over to the truck, and raised the hood. Been here all night, huh? Asked Turner as he attempted to place his hand on the engine's valve cover, which was too hot to touch. You haven't gone out at all, have you Rogers or somebody had recently run the engine hard thought Turner as he pulled his hand away from the hot engine. What happened to your hand? 
asked Turner, observing that Roger's right hand was bandaged, cut yourself. Rogers explained that he'd been using a hacksaw a few hours earlier when it suddenly slipped and cut his hand. Turner asked if he'd left the shop for first aid. Rogers responded that he'd gone to Willamette Falls Hospital in Oregon City that same morning to treat the wound. So he had left the shop reflected. Turner also wondered why the man had initially lied about it. If he didn't have anything to hide, why was he acting so suspiciously? There is no doubt that Roger's pickup was the one seen fleeing the scene of the crime. It matched an appearance, and the license plate identification was the same because of that and his suspicious demeanor. Rogers was arrested a few minutes later and taken to the Clackamas County Jail in Oregon City, where he was held on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, the detectives identified the dead woman as 25-year-old Jennifer Lisa Smith, mother of two. Her last known address was in the 4800 block of North Albino Avenue in Portland, not far from Union Avenue. Additional background on Smith revealed that she had an arrest record for prostitution and indecent exposure background on Rogers revealed that he was no stranger to law enforcement. 1972. When he was 18, Rogers picked up a 15-year-old girl hitchhiking in Eugene, Oregon. He had convinced her to go to a remote area to have sex with him. Detectives learned risking a charge of statutory Rogers picked the girl up again a few days later, and they went together to a park to gather wood to make whistles for neighborhood kids, but he took her into a wooded area to again have sex with her. After lying down on the ground, Rogers leaned over as if to kiss the girl instead. According to police reports, he stabbed in the abdomen with a hunting knife after pulling the knife from her stomach. The girl bleeding profusely and in intense pain convinced Rogers to take her to a hospital for treatment. She survived and later told authorities about the attack. On February 13, 1973, Rogers pleaded guilty to second-degree assault and was placed on four years probation for that attack. Less than six months later, the detectives learned Rogers assaulted two 15-year-old girls with a soft drink bottle, although charged with one count each of second- and third-degree assaults. Rogers was found not guilty because of mental disease or defected Oregon's equivalent to an insanity plea. He was sent to the Oregon State Hospital by Lane County Circuit Court Judge Helen Fry. He was released from the hospital on December 12, 1974. These incidents prompted Daryl L. Lawson Lane County Deputy District Attorney to write an after-sentence report on Rogers. This man is in extreme danger to the community, particularly to young women. He is both sexually and physically violent and, without question, is a murder case looking for a place to happen. In January 1976, Rogers was indicted of first degree in Clackamas County, but he was eventually acquitted of the charge in February 1976. However, while the Clackamas County charge was still pending, Rogers picked up two Kaiser Oregon High School girls and at knife point, allegedly one and threatened the other, according to John L. Collins Yamhill County District Attorney. The two girls had skipped school and were walking down Kaiser Street when Rogers saw them and convinced them to go with them. He was a good talker, and his method at the time was to pick up girls, particularly blonde girls, said Collins. They got into the car with them, and they went to get some beer after drinking beer and smoking marijuana together. Said Collins Rogers took a paring knife from the car he was driving from the glove box and threatened the girls with it. He used coat hanger wire to bind the girls' wrists and ankles. Afterward, he apologized and pretended like it was all some kind of game, said Collins Rogers was nonetheless indicted on charges of rape and coercion. He pleaded not guilty because of mental disease or defect. Rogers was convicted only on the coercion charge and received a maximum five-year prison sentence. This was a less enlightened time, said Collins, when juries often felt that if the woman or girl contributed to them anyway, they would not convict him in this case. I think it was because they drank beer and smoked marijuana with them. As the detectives probed deeper into Rogers' background, they learned that he had been in and out of jail for various reasons, including parole and probation violations and kidnapping a local prostitute. All in all, the detectives learned, Rogers spent 27 months in Oregon prisons. 
His parole was finally terminated in January 1983. Meanwhile, acting on a tip from one of Roger's relatives, investigators returned to the suspect's Woodburn Auto Repair Shop, where they sifted ashes from a wood stove in Roger's office. They found what appeared to be remnants of a burned tennis shoe analysis later determined that metal parts found in the wood stove closely matched the metal parts of the shoe discovered in the parking lot where Jennifer Smith was murdered. They also found pieces of colored glass rhinestones and star-shaped grommets inside the stove. Their source is unknown. Roger's truck had been impounded shortly after his arrest after he had obtained warrants and carefully searched it for evidence. According to criminalists, there was blood inside the cab of the pickup, numerous knife cuts on the dashboard, upholstery ceiling, and passenger door. They also found a stale fingerprint matching Jennifer Smith's right ring finger on the passenger door outside handles. The search examination also turned up a small green band in the bed of the pickup. They later determined it had come from a small container of ready-to-drink orange juice. Next, in their efforts to build a stronger case against Rogers, the detectives went to Willamette Falls Hospital in Oregon City to see how much of the suspect's story about his wounded hand was true. After questioning the emergency room doctor who had attended to the wounds, the detectives learned that the cuts were not jagged as they would have been if a hacksaw blade had made them. They had been smooth and clean, more like wounds that a knife blade would have caused. Although gut feelings told the investigators that Rogers was there, man, they nonetheless assembled a photo, lay down a group of six photographs of men, including Rogers, who had similar appearances. They displayed the lay down to eyewitness Michael Fielding. It took him less than 20 seconds to identify Dayton Rogers as the man he had seen stopped briefly under a streetlight as he fled. Denny's restaurant parking lot because Jennifer Smith was a known prostitute and because of Rogers has continued interest in hookers, detectives hit Portland streets. They interviewed as many hookers as they could, focusing their attention on those who knew Jennifer. Not surprisingly, the detectives found several who knew Rogers. Too many of the hookers that the detectives talked to identified Rogers from a photo lay down. Several said he told them his name was Steve. One of the women even told investigators that she saw Jennifer Smith walk towards his pickup as if to get inside three hours before she was found murdered. The detectives learned that he nearly always told the girls he was a professional gambler, usually saying that he was from Las Vegas but sometimes saying that he was from Reno. He typically offered $40 to $80 for the sexual scenario that involved bondage. He always had the girls completely undress, after which he bound their hands and feet at the wrists and ankles with rope, dog collars, wire, nylon stockings, shoelaces, and the like anything that would hold their arms and feet securely in place. But many said that Rogers went far beyond bondage, subjecting them to intense physical pain, torture, even mutilation. One prostitute told the detectives that Rogers had a foot fetish and found women's arches sexually arousing. An interesting point, the detectives noted, considering that Jennifer Smith was barefoot when her body was found. Other prostitutes said that all the dates occurred in Rogers' cab pickup, and Rogers usually began by drinking vodka and orange juice. He usually stopped at a convenience store, said the hookers where he bought ready-to-drink juice in small plastic containers. One of the prostitutes accompanied a detective to the convenience store and picked out the brand of orange juice. Rogers usually bought in small plastic containers with green plastic caps. Security sealed with green bands, just like the one found in the bed of Roger's pickup. He usually bought the vodka in the individual serving 1.5-ounce bottles, like those served by airlines. One hooker told the detectives that Rogers picked her up and agreed to pay her $50 for straight sex. Instead, he tied her hands and feet and tortured her for hours by biting her on the breasts, buttocks, and feet hard enough to draw blood. Another prostitute said she was subjected to the same treatment type, except that he threatened to cut off her breasts with a knife. Yet another hooker told the detectives that Rogers cut off her clothes with a machete, and another said he cut the hell of her foot with a carving knife. One of the women said he had subjected her to so much pain during a six-hour ordeal that she'd asked him to kill her. 
All of the women said that Rogers likes to masturbate during the encounters from Jennifer Smith's body's definitive autopsy. Dr. Karen Gunson, a deputy state medical examiner, determined that there were at least 11 knife wounds to the victim's body, 10 of which were very deep. The medical examiner said that there were eight stab wounds to the front of Jennifer's body, one of which severed a major artery on the left side of her chest and was likely the cause of death. Jennifer also sustained slashing wounds to both of her breasts, two deep stab wounds to her abdomen that pierced her stomach, and of these shaped stab wounds in her back that pierced her liver. Doctor. Gunson explained that the V-shaped wound might have been caused by two stabs that had overlapped. The victim also had slash wounds to both of her hands that cut all the way to the bone wounds, which Dr. Gunson described as defensive injuries caused when the victim tried to grab the knife blade from her attacker or otherwise tried to prevent him from stabbing her. Jennifer's throat had also been slit. There were other wounds, said Dr. Gunson, including two quarter-inch wide bruises around both wrists. These bruises indicated that Jennifer had been tied up, perhaps with the shoelaces found at the crime scene. Gunson said that a significant amount of pressure must have been applied to Jennifer's wrists for such bruising to occur. After the investigators presented their case to a Clackamas County grand jury, Dayton Leroy Rogers was indicted of aggravated murder in Jennifer Smith's death. The indictment alleged that Rogers murdered Smith during the course of kidnapping, sexual abuse, and torture. It also alleged that Rogers killed Smith to cover up the other crimes. Rogers retained attorney Arthur B. Knows of Oregon City, to represent him, and he pleaded innocent to the charges. He was held without bail. In the meantime, on Monday August 31st, every Spaniard 46, a crossbow hunter in pursuit of prey on a private 90,000-acre timber farm southeast of Malala, Oregon, nearly stumbled over the nude, partly buried body of a young woman. Partially covered the body in an advanced state of decomposition with the brush. Unnerved by his gruesome discovery. The hunter left the forest as quickly as possible and reported his find to the Clackamas County authorities. When investigators arrived at the remote site, a recreation area near the Malala River is popular with fishers, swimmers, hunters, hikers, and other outdoor types. The bow hunter led them up an old dirt logging road through the rugged mountain forest mixed with evergreens and deciduous trees to a nearly vertical slope where he discovered the body, even though it was a little difficult to get to, the investigators had no trouble finding the corpse. At first glance, the detectives couldn't tell if the forces of nature had buried the body or if someone had attempted to conceal it. But one thing was certain she was a murder victim due to the lateness of the hour, no attempt was made to search the crime scene that evening. Instead, deputies were posted nearby as centuries to protect the scene until criminalists arrived the next morning. Shortly after the search for evidence began the next day, searchers found two more corpses within 50 feet of each other in the same general area as the first. The scene appeared to be a cluster dump, similar to those used by the Green River serial killer in Washington state. Unsure of what they were dealing with here, the investigators temporarily halted the search while Colt, the Clackamas County Sheriff Department's tracking dog, was brought in to assist in the search for more bodies. Over the next five days, brought down a total of seven female corpses from the forest ridge. Each of the victims was in varying degrees of decomposition, but two were markedly more advanced, having been there considerably longer than the others. Despite the striking similarities between the female victims on the Malala Forest Slope and Jennifer Smith, the detectives didn't look at first focus on Dayton Leroy Rogers as a possible suspect. He was in jail charged with a different murder. However, as Detective Turner walked around the forest site, he soon spotted miniature vodka bottles, an old package that had purchased them in, and disposable orange juice bottles, the same kind found in the back of Dayton Rogers' pickup. As a result, it didn't take long for Turner to begin focusing on Dayton Rogers as the prime suspect in the Malala Forest murders. He also reasoned that many, if not most of the Malala Forest victims would turn out to have a history of prostitution arrests when all was said and done. The dead, it turned out, were identified over the next several months as Lisa Marie Mark 23 Maureen and Hodges 26 Christine Lotus Adams. 
35 non-discs the 70s 26 aka non-IKEA. Austin Reith Beguiles 16 and Cynthia Diane Dever 21. Identified the seventh body was in August 2013. Her name was Tanya Jerry Johnson, and she was 18 years old. At the time of her death, Tanya was identified through analysis of DNA samples. Just as Turner had figured, most of the victims had either worked as prostitutes at the time of their deaths or had arrest records for prior prostitution offenses. Some were heroin addicts. Only one had no links to prostitution or drugs at the time of the gruesome discovery in the Malala forest. The investigators wouldn't say what they had for evidence against Rogers. However, one source close to the investigation maintained that he was the prime suspect in the forest murders and that they had enough evidence to bring him to trial in those killings. Still, they wanted to wait and see how his trial for the murder of Jennifer Smith turned out before charging him with the Malala forest murders. At Rogers' trial, which began in February 1988 in Clackamas County Circuit Court, Judge Patrick D. Gilroy, Deputy District Attorney Andre I. Giggle, Itis told the jury that Rogers murdered Jennifer Smith by design. Following a pattern, he's established with prostitutes. Gladys called Rogers a vicious predator who killed for a sexual thrill. You'll find that the reason he went to downtown Portland was to satisfy what you will find to be his bizarre sexual appetite, said Deputy D with a giggle. Itis Rogers. Attorney Arthur Nose told jurors that they would not like his client but insisted that they were there to decide whether what Mr. Rogers did was tantamount to a criminal act and not to judge his sexual mores. Knaus admitted that Rogers killed Jennifer Smith, but contended that he did so in self-defense. There, it was the preposterous claim of self-defense. Gladys had known that it was coming, and he had prepared himself to accept that would present such a defense. He couldn't believe it, but he accepted it. He knew he would convince the jury. Otherwise, the evidence would show them. The truth knows maintain that Smith spotted more than $200 in Roger's wallet when they stopped at the convenience store to buy orange juice, and she decided to rob the defendant at knife point. Later, when Rogers got out of the truck to urinate, Smith pulled a knife from the glove compartment and brought it close to Rogers his throat and demanded his wallet declared Knaus a struggle followed and turned into a wrestling match for the knife in which Jennifer Smith was stabbed several times and killed purely by accident. Early in the trial, the jury heard testimony from several witnesses who said they heard the victim scream in intense pain for approximately two minutes before discovering her body. He presented testimony from the medical examiner, who displayed graphic photos of Jennifer's wounds. At one point in the trial, jurors, her testimony from the woman Rogers had stabbed in 1972 when he was 18, and she was 15. She explained how she had met Rogers when he picked her up while she hitchhiked in Eugene and how we took her to a remote area to have sex on that day and a subsequent date. We'd hold hands and swing around and talk and smile said the prior victim who came close to tears at several points. Then we sat down, and we were talking, and he tickled my legs and told me to close my eyes. Then I felt the plunge. She explained that Rogers had stabbed her in the belly, just left of her navel. She stopped momentarily and showed jurors a six vertical scar. I thought a rattlesnake had bitten me. If it wasn't that, I thought a horse had kicked me. Said the woman, I looked down and saw the knife in my abdomen and the blood coming out. The woman testified that Rogers told her he just couldn't trust her anymore and was afraid that she might turn him in for having sex with her while she was underage, fearing that he would finish her off. She lied to him and told him she loved him. I said, Dayton, I love you. He began to tell me he would marry me and do anything. She said, if she promised to tell the police, she stabbed herself accidentally. She agreed to his plan. But doctors at Eugene's Sacred Heart Hospital told her they didn't believe the wound was self-inflicted. I was afraid he would come there and kill me, she said. Then, she added, she changed her mind and told the police the truth. Another witness told the jury about an incident that occurred between her and Rogers in February 201,976. According to the witness, who was 19 at the time of the incident, Rogers picked her up as she walked towards Salem to visit her boyfriend, 
who was incarcerated at the Oregon State Correctional Institution. The woman was in Roger's car's back seat when he suddenly pulled over and took a knife from the glove compartment. She said he hogtied her and then cut off her clothing with the knife. I was scared, and he was, you know, he was going to kill me, said the woman, he said he had to kill me because he was afraid I'd go to the police. She testified that Rogers eventually let her out of the car near her grandmother's home in Oregon City, Janet K. Anderson, a Clackamas County corrections officer who supervised Rogers while he was on parole for the 1976 coercion conviction in which he tied up to other high school girls at knife point, testified that she interviewed the defendant in September 1982. I asked him if he were to do this all over again if he would do anything differently. Anderson testified that there would not be a witness next time when cross-examined by defense attorney Nose Anderson told the jurors that she took Rogers' statements seriously. Still, she hadn't included them in her report. Mr. Rogers' intentions appear sincere to maintain counsel and to remain crime-free. Anderson wrote in a letter to the State Board of Parole, which read to the jury, Mr. Rogers does not appear to be a threat to the community. The parole officer added that the language used in the letter and her report was typical of language used when terminating parole supervision. However, she said her personal notes on Rogers indicated that the suspect appears well adjusted, but because of the crime and the surrounding circumstances, one never knows. At another point in the trial, Rogers testified in his own defense before the seven-man, five-woman jury, and he told them he paid Jennifer Smith $40 for a sexual encounter that involved bondage. He explained that when he got out of the truck to urinate after having bound Jennifer's hands and feet with shoelaces, the prostitute slipped out of her bindings and took a knife from the glove box when he got back inside the truck that's when she attacked me. While still nude, Rogers said that Jennifer held the knife to his throat and ordered him not to move and give her his wallet. He said, do it or die. Jennifer told him he refused and fought back, fearing for his life. He said he knocked her arm away and wrestled her for the knife, which she eventually obtained. I got a hold of it and used the knife on her. I was just going back and forth in virtually any direction I could testify Rogers explaining how Jennifer received so many cuts. She eventually jumped from the truck, and he chased her across the parking lot. He eventually grabbed her, he said, and she fell to the pavement, both of our feet entangled, he said, she went down backward, and I fell on top of her on the way down. That's when I stabbed during the upper area here, he testified, indicating the right side of his chest near the shoulder. No one wants Danton Leroy Rogers released, Nassib said only minutes before the jury left the courtroom to decide his client's fate. I don't want him released. You don't want him released. I question whether Mr. Rogers even wants himself released. What's needed is the permanent isolation of this man in his fantasy land. He's become a sexual monster you've heard about from these girls. He's developed and nurtured these feelings into a ritual. It's a pattern you can't ignore. He's a sick man. But do we kill him? Do we have a death sentence for people who are sick and depraved? As this continued, Knaus, look at the evidence? After killing Miss Smith, he goes back to work and thinks about going out to a coffee shop. The state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he's a sick man but argued knows he doesn't deserve a death sentence. Four hours later, the 12 jurors returned and announced that they had unanimously voted that the murder of Jenny Smith was deliberate. They also unanimously voted that Jenny's murder was an unreasonable response to any provocation from the victim. However, after one juror adamantly opposed the death penalty, all 12 agreed that Rogers would not pose a continuing threat to society because he would be imprisoned for life. Judge Gilroy immediately sentenced Dayton to life in prison. Detective John Turner and his colleagues were devastated by the sentence. The jurors apparently thought that a life sentence meant that Dayton would never be released, but they had been wrong under a life sentence. He would be eligible for parole someday. Even if it was 20 or 30 years down the road, they had inadvertently given Dayton Leroy Rogers yet another chance to escape his just punishment. Another chance to slip through the cracks of the system. With the Malala Forest case looming in the future, 
The prosecution had another chance to get a death sentence for Dayton, it was the good guy's ace in the hole, and they would play it for the next two months. Turner and his colleagues worked closely with the Dawes office and presented the worst serial murder case in Oregon's history to a grand jury. On May 4, 1988, Dayton was indicted on several charges of aggravated murder under various law theories for the deaths of Reith Argyle's Lisa, Mock Nani's servant, says Cynthia Dever, Christine Adams, and Maureen Hodges. He was not charged in the unidentified victim's death, although the investigators were certain that he had murdered her too. As before, Dayton pleaded innocent this time around Christopher E. Burris, not Arthur Knauss, was hired to represent him. Turner and his fellow detectives spent the next eight months rounding up additional witnesses to interview as well as re-interviewing many of the others. They carefully went over the evidence, and they put their casebooks in order. By the time the trial began, they knew the case frontward and backward. Jury selection which began on February 6, 1989, took nearly two months to complete. Ironically, considering the types of crimes Dayton was being charged with committing, an all-woman panel of 12 was seated with an additional female as an alternate. When the trial finally opened on March 30, 1989, this time in Clackamas County Circuit Judge Raymond's courtroom, Bagley Jr. A. Gladys outlined his case for the jurors, contending that he found a knife identical to the one used to kill Jenny Smith near the Malala Forest victims' bodies. By the time that Gladys was finished with his presentation of what the jury would be considering, there was little left for the imagination for the next five weeks, and the jury heard horrifying testimony from many of the women whom Dayton Leroy Rogers had violated and tortured at one time or another, but who had miraculously survived. Each explained in graphic detail, often tearfully, the atrocities that Dayton had committed against them. One former prostitute testified about her fifth and final date with Dayton, an encounter that lasted more than six hours after picking her up on Southeast 82nd Avenue and drove her to the Malala Forest. He got out of the truck, she testified and went over to the side where you could see over the forest. He said how beautiful it was. I went back to the truck and started to get undressed. He came up behind me and started to put the bondage devices on. When I told him they were too tight that they were cutting into my wrists, he said that's what he wanted to do. One of Dayton's relatives also testified, telling the jurors how we helped Dayton establish his business and then closed it down after Dayton's arrest. He told of how he found all of the suspicious items in the wood stove inside the Dayton shop, including items that appeared to be the metal interportions of shoes. He burst into tears twice during his testimony and diverted his eyes away from Dayton. Most of the time, he was on the witness stand in tears and in tones that were barely audible Floria Adams. The 15-year-old daughter of the victim, Christine Adams, testified the decorative studs, star-shaped grommets that found in Dayton's wood stove came from her mother's pants sobbing. She told the jurors that she recognized the studs, Bob, Thompson. The Oregon State Police criminologist who worked closely on the case explained how he had found pieces of colored glass in Lisa's marks, hair and how, although he hadn't been able to determine their source, they were similar to glass parts found inside Dayton's wood stove. He also testified that hairs found inside Dayton's pickup were microscopically and microscopically similar to head hairs he compared from the remains of Lisa. Mark Nani, Cervantes and Cynthia Dever. This man said Biglitas in his closing argument, pointing at Dayton. This man is obsessed totally consumed sexually with a woman's feet and dominance. Gladys also reminded the jurors about all of the orange juice containers and miniature liquor bottles found at the Malala forced crime scene, insisting that they made up a part of Roger's signature. If there is a signature to a crime, under those circumstances, you can look at the signature, said Biglitas, and see the killer's identity. This evidence is the mark of Zorro. It's the signature. The defendant. Ladies of the jury not only committed these murders, but he might as well have written his name on the victim's corpses as in the Jenny Smith case. There had been little doubt at the trial's outset that Dayton would be convicted of the Malala Forest murders, which is precisely what happened on May 4. After barely six hours of deliberation, 
the jury found Dayton guilty of aggravated murder on all counts for the first time in public. Dayton, dressed in a conservative, dark blue suit, displayed emotion by covering his head with his hands, shaking his head. He could be heard saying no repeatedly, only his sentence's question remained much of the testimony. The jury would like to decide his fate centered on Dayton's character, his worthiness to remain alive and psychological arguments about his past violence. James P. Witch P., a vocational instructor at the Oregon State Correctional Institution, explained how he had taught Dayton the skills he needed to become a mechanic. When Dayton was in prison for the 1976 attack on the two Kaiser Oregon High School girls, he had picked up when the girls skipped school. Dayton learned fast, said who P in barely two years, he went from being a person with little or no mechanical skills to someone with high skills, he said he selected Dayton to be his apprentice a few months before Dayton was due to be released from prison. James E. Miller, another vocational instructor at the prison, testified that he knew Dayton before being arrested for the 1976 offenses. The two of them, he said, played table tennis together at Seventh-day Adventist social gatherings. Miller explained that he was surprised when he ran into Dayton in prison, but he was determined to help him despite his offenses. In fact, Dayton helped organize Adventist church services at the prison, which attracted about a dozen inmates. Dayton always played guitar at the services and seemed sincere in his religious convictions. When presented, psychologist James R. Adams explained that Dayton committed violent acts only under particular circumstances, such as when he was intoxicated and sexually aroused in a scenario that included bondage and foot fetishism. For him to become violent, he also must possess a feeling that he had been cheated either emotionally or sexually, and he must always have a helpless woman as his victim. He also needed to maintain a reasonable certainty that he wouldn't be caught for his crimes, and his victim must be someone he can dehumanize, such as a prostitute. Adam contended that Dayton needed all of these factors present for him to become violent in prison. Adam said those factors would not be available to him, and he would not be a threat to men. On the other hand, said John B. Cochran, the senior forensic psychologist at the Oregon State Hospital. Dayton would, in fact, pose a continuing threat. Even in prison, Cochran detailed a homosexual relationship that Dayton had been engaged in and contended that without the availability of women as victims, it would only be a matter of time before he began selecting male victims. Cochran, who had studied many serial killers over the course of his career and had served as a consultant to the Green River Task Force, explained that the very act of murder could be very pleasurable for sexually sadistic serial killers such as Dayton. If you compare it with everyday sexual experiences, he said, there's just no comparison. Cochran explained that most serial killers fantasize about murders so frequently that killing becomes second nature. Some even develop a sexual bond to the murder weapon they use in arguing that Dayton's life is spared. Christopher Boris said that his client was a sick man who should be locked away forever, not put to death. He cited Dayton's good prison record that he was a model prisoner who helped establish church services and had experienced no conflicts with other inmates. Boris suggested that the murders and other crimes taken committed were not carried out in a deliberate state of mind. Egg Whites, on the other hand, characterized Dayton as a walking time bomb. He said it was only a matter of time before he began his pattern of deceit all over again. He described a witness, clever one who is capable not only of luring and then deceiving his victims but of deceiving and manipulating the psychologists who had examined him. He had done time and time again and would continue in the same pattern if, given the opportunity, he can in every respect, said Biglitis, addressing the jury in his bid for the death penalty, including his appearance, walk among you without giving any indication of the horrors that are within him. Dayton Leroy Rogers is a walking time bomb. He is an act of criminal violence, looking for a place to happen. He's capable of fooling psychologists. He is capable of fooling psychiatrists. I hope to God he is not capable of fooling you. On Wednesday, June 7, 1989. After more than 17 hours of grueling deliberation, the jury voted unanimously that Dayton had murdered his victims deliberately and without reason, 
if any provocation, and that he would be a continuing threat to society. Whether behind prison walls or on the outside, Judge Bagley sentenced Dayton Leroy Rogers to death by lethal injection. It was righteous justice, said Turner, solemn-faced but obviously pleased after hearing the verdict and sentence righteousness, in the sense that an all-female jury convicted him and decided his fate. Although John Turner, his colleagues, and Andia Gladys couldn't have been happier with the outcome. They knew that the bizarre case of Dayton Leroy Rogers was not over. It would never be over in their lifetimes. Even if Dayton's appointment with the executioners, a needle was, in fact, ever carried out. Dayton had left behind too many deaths, too many scars, too many shattered lives not only among his own family but especially among the families of his countless victims, whether dead or alive, for his rampage to be quickly forgotten. Aside from testifying at his first trial, Dayton Leroy Rogers had not spoken to authorities since invoking his rights against self-incrimination. Shortly after his arrest for the murder of Jenny Smith and again, when Detective Mikado tried to question him about the Malala Forest murders, kids shown no remorse for his crimes. Rogers was sentenced to death three times and three times. The Oregon Supreme Court vacated the sentence of death and remanded the case for a new trial. The first two Supreme Court decisions came in 1992 and 2000. In both instances, a jury again imposed the death penalty. On April 11, 2012, the Oregon Supreme Court vacated his latest death sentence and remanded the case for a new trial on the appropriate penalty. On November 16, 2015, a Clackamas County jury sentenced Rogers to death for the fourth time. According to his defense attorney, Rogers would have waived all future appeals and allocated to his crimes in exchange for a true life sentence instead of the death penalty. He's allowed 20 minutes out of every 24 hours to shower, shave and exercise. Many of Dayton Leroy Rogers' surviving victims have started new lives working to overcome drug habits and become productive citizens. A few have died due to their lifestyles, and others were still working the streets. In the case of Dayton Leroy Rogers, one burning question remains how many other bodies, victims of Dayton's bloodlust, are still lying in Oregon's forests awaiting discovery. Unfortunately, unless Dayton decides to talk, may never answer that question. Thanks for watching.